This is going to be a study on the subject of Bible weaponry. And Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines weapons as any instrument of offense, anything used or designed to be used in destroying or annoying an enemy, an instrument for contest or for combating enemies, an instrument of defense. We don't use physical weapons today. To fight for God, we use the Word of God, but we are going to look at some of the weapons mentioned in the Bible and see what we can learn from each of these weapons. And the first one we're going to look at is the flaming sword. In Genesis 3.24, it says, So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God places cherubims east of the Garden of Eden to keep anyone out who might partake of the tree of life. And here is why he did it in Genesis 3.22. It says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So if Adam and Eve would have partook of the tree of life, they would live forever in their sinful state. He not only placed cherubims there, but he had these cherubims holding flaming swords. And a lot of people believe that these cherubims stayed there until the time of the flood. And if that is true, then there was a constant reminder that man sinned and that he got kicked out of that garden. And no doubt about it, every time Adam saw that flaming sword that turned every way, he remembered what happened that day when he died spiritually. And this reminds me of the Word of God because in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then in Jeremiah 20 and verse 9 it says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. God likens his words to a sword and a burning fire. And that kind of reminds you of a flaming sword. And similar to when Adam was reminded of his sin when he walk by and seeing the cherubims holding a flaming sword. We are reminded of our sin when we see someone like a preacher, our street preacher waving a King James Bible back and forth. When we open the book, it shows us our sinful state and cuts us to pieces. And Romans 7.13 says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. When you read the commandments laid out in the Bible, it cuts you. When you read verses like Romans 3.23 and Matthew 7.11, it reminds us that we are wicked and evil people. So the Bible talks about a flaming sword, and it also talks about Simon Peter's sword in John 18 and verse 10. It says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear, the servant's name was Malchus. So Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, but the Lord put it right back on his head. And then in verse 11 it says, Then Jesus said unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So Peter didn't realize Jesus had to be crucified. And Peter wasn't just trying to cut this guy's ear off, he was going for his head. Have you ever tried to take someone's head off with your sword, the Bible? Sometimes we need to use it in that way, like when it comes to rebuking a person who is spreading a false gospel or a Bible corrector, because it calls people who are spreading a false gospel accursed in Galatians 1, 8 through 9. But when we are witnessing or talking to a lost person, we shouldn't do like Peter did here and aim for their head. We should aim a little lower like Peter did in Acts 2, 36-37. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, What shall we do? Our weapon should be used to prick the heart. And we should use our weapon similar to how Ehud used his weapon in Judges 3.16. It says, But Ehud 
made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So he made him a dagger with two edges. So you notice a connection here. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And then Judges 3.17 says, And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man, and when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. So all that stood by him went out from him. And did you know that the best way to witness to someone is one-on-one? -on -one? Like Ehud has gotten Eglon here. In Judges 3.20 it says, And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat, and Ehud put forth his left hand, and took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. So Ehud stabs the fat king Eglon right in his gut, and the Bible says the dirt came out. And this is a picture of a Bible believer witnessing to a lost sinner, because you get a sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God. You get the person one-on-one. -on -one like he did here, and then you hit them where it hurts with verses like Romans 3.23, Isaiah 53.6, Galatians 3.22, and any verse that shows them their sinful state and that their righteousness isn't worth shooting and that there is a hell that lost people go to when they die. And the word of God is guaranteed to make the dirt come out as it did here in Judges chapter 3. And the dirt here in Judges chapter 3 would be Eglon's dung. And the word of God will clean up your insides. When a man hears the gospel preached and then receives Jesus Christ, believing on his precious blood, he gets his soul cut loose from his flesh, and then he puts on the new man. He just has that dirty man on the outside, which he will get rid of at the rapture. So when approaching a lost sinner, get your sword, which is the word of God, Get him one-on-one. -on -one. Don't try to cut his head off. Just hit him where it hurts. Give him verses that will prick his heart. And I noticed this just now just by reading. In Judges 3.22, it says, And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And that is a picture, too, once the word gets in you, once you read the Bible and stay constantly reading the Bible every day, once it gets in you, you can't get it back out. You're ruined. But I hear a lot of pastors and preachers or whoever saying things like sodomites should be put to death by the government and holding up signs saying God hates fags. And there are a lot of good street preachers I've seen on YouTube and there are are some bad ones who just stand on the sidewalk and just basically insult people that walk by. And they are using their sword to take off someone's head instead of pricking their heart. Don't try to take off their head, just prick their heart and hit them in the gut with Bible verses that will put them under conviction. The Bible will cut them a lot better than your words can. And giving them the word of God will make them feel a lot worse than you just insulting them. Just quote verses like Isaiah 53, 6, Romans 3, 23, Galatians 3, 22, and other verses like that, and it will prick their heart. And the next weapons we're going to look at would be the weapons <clears throat> of Michael and Jesus Christ. Michael seems to go against Satan the same way that we should go against Satan in Judges Chapter 1 and verse 9 it says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Satan doesn't seem to be phased by physical weapons. It describes him in Job 41 in his natural state as Leviathan. Job 41, 26-30 says, the sword of him that layeth at him, 
cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. So we should approach Satan the same way Michael the archangel does and say, let the Lord rebuke thee and rebuke him with the words of God like Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus kept saying over and over again, it is written, it is written. And then Matthew chapter 4, 11 says, the devil leaveth him. So when the devil comes to tempt you, just get some words of God that you've got memorized, quote those verses, and after a little while, the devil's going to leave you. And then Michael will fight against Satan and his angels in the future. In Revelation 12 through 9, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. If this is a physical fight, then Michael is using weapons that we definitely don't have that would be able to face Satan. We don't have physical weapons that could face the devil. Michael probably confronts Satan the same way he did in Jude one nine, and says the Lord rebuke thee and just uses the word of God. And this war probably ends quick like it does in Revelation 20 and verse 9. And Satan is probably defeated with the words of God like he is at the second coming. Look at Revelation 19.15. It says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword. This is talking about Jesus. That with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And we're going to use the words of God against Satan like Michael and Jesus Christ do in those verses. And then you have... The next weapon we're going to talk about is Shamgar's ox goad. In Judges 3.31 it says, And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox goad. And he also delivered Israel. And I looked up the definition of ox goad, and it says the goad is a traditional farming implement used to spur or guide livestock, usually oxen, which are pulling a plow or a cart used also to round up cattle. It is a type of long stick with a pointed end, also known as the cattle prod. So Shamgar didn't use a sword, he used an ox goad. And this goes to show you that you can fight for God with what you presently have. Maybe Shamgar didn't have a sword at that time, so he used an ox goad. Maybe you are a new Christian, and you are studying the Bible, but you don't know much Bible yet. You can still fight for the Lord with what you do know. He can use what you have stored in your memory at the moment. Surely you at least know verses like John 3.16 and Romans 3.23 and how to tell a man how to be saved. You may not be able to write a commentary or know the deeper things yet, but God can use what you know so far. And then the next weapon we're going to look at is Moses' rod. And Moses used his staff to prove to unbelieving Jews that he was telling the truth about God. In Exodus 4.1 it says, And Moses, asked, Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it, and the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And then verse 6 says, And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, 
and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. So Moses' rod was used as a sign to unbelieving Jews, and 1 Corinthians one twenty two says the Jews require a sign. And in our situation, when we are witnessing or teaching someone about the King James Bible, they may have doubts in their mind about the Bible. They may think that it's got errors in it or that they can go to the Greek to change it and correct it and make it say something it doesn't say so that it can fit their doctrinal belief for their denomination or religion. They may have been brainwashed by a college-educated people who don't care about the words of God. They just want to be the final authority. And they're telling them that God's book's got errors in it. And you can use the word of God like Moses used his rod. You can give them signs and proof that the Bible is real. And you do this just by showing them Bible verses. You can start out by showing them prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Show them verses like Isaiah 50 and verse 6 which says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And then show them where those prophecies are fulfilled in the New Testament. Show them verses like 2 Timothy 3 through 7, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, where it talks about in the last days perilous times shall come and show those characteristics and show them how the Bible is is turning out to be true and how this world is turning out just like the Bible described it. The same way Moses used his rod to convince unbelievers, you can use the pure words of God to convince unbelievers that the word of God is just that, the words of God. And then the next weapon we'll look at is Jesus' whip. In John 2.13 it says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that had sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. A lot of people, and especially the Hollywood crowd, doesn't think Jesus Christ is capable of capable of doing something like he did in these verses. They believe he is just some hippie that loves everything and everybody, and you can be a sodomite or an adulterer or whatever and just get a pat on the back. But the book says Jesus got mad sometimes. Sometimes we have to use our weapon like Jesus used his weapon here. He didn't approach them gently. The people that you don't approach gently are people like Bible correctors. If a man is correcting God's words, then you can get rough with him. These people who come out with the new Bibles are in it for money. They don't care about the words of God. They love the money, and the love of money is the root of all evil. It takes a wicked man to change the word of God, especially if he knows that he's changing it. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, Speak we Christ. Speak we in Christ. Did you know the new Bibles will change the word corrupt to the word pedal? They know what they are doing. Why do you think they took the word corrupt out of that verse? They hold the word of God in unrighteousness. And Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They should be exposed and you should use the words of God to expose them. I'm not big on naming names. Like if someone is a King James Bible believer and they are winning souls and aren't preaching any great false doctrine, then I'm not going to name their name and blast that person just because I don't agree with them in a few places. And I heard something good from Robert Breaker the other day. He said he's not going to name names and run down a man's ministry who is a King James believer and that's winning souls of Jesus Christ because we're not supposed to be running down everyone's ministry. We should just teach the Bible and win souls to Jesus Christ. And if people are open to the Word of God, then they'll accept the words of God. 
And if you teach them the Bible, then they're going to be able to see error when someone presents it to them. But I agree with what he says completely. And the time that it is okay to name names and put someone on blast is in cases where someone is so insincere that they will change the word of God. I think you should warn people about that person by saying that person's name. I'm not saying you have to just go all out and insult that person and make your whole ministry revolve around exposing him. I'm just saying sometimes you got to name his name, just like Paul had to do at times. Like it says in 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. And some people accuse uh, preachers like Peter Ruckman of being mean-spirited and a smart aleck. But if you read his books, he is only mean and ugly to the people who correct God's book. He doesn't approach a lost person in that manner. He approached people who corrected the book in that way. Sometimes you do have to get angry. And what better to get angry about than someone trying to change the words of God? Does it not make you angry when you see the new versions mess with the virgin birth of Christ, the deity of Christ, the sinlessness of Christ, the blood of Christ, and pretty much everything about Jesus Christ? That should make you mad if you are a Christian. In cases like that, it is okay to use your weapon, the words of God, like Jesus used his whip. You can get rough with them and tell them they're acting like a Satanist. And you know how they are acting like a Satanist? Because Satanists believe they can be their own God. And when a man corrects the book and thinks he can go to the Greek to change it so that it, fix, so that it fits his doctrine... He is setting himself up as the final authority and making himself God. But the next weapon we're going to look at is Phineas's javelin. And look at this very interesting story in Numbers 25.1. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, and they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Bel Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined to Bel Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of, the, both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. So he killed these these two. He killed the, this wicked men in, but a nightish woman who worshipped a false god. And Phineas obtained righteousness for doing this. He, had, he obtained righteousness for executing judgment on sin. In Psalms 106, 30 through 31, it says, Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment. And so the plague was stayed, and that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. The wicked Midianitish woman was turning Israel away from God. They were worshiping a different God than the true God of the Bible. And Phineas used his weapon to execute judgment. The same way Phineas used his weapon to get rid of evil, you can use your weapon, the King James Bible, to fight against evil. If a movement or person or group of people is turning Christians away from God, then you should cry against it. You should cry against that movement or people. And Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We don't physically harm people with weapons. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We fight evil with words. If Christians would speak out against wicked things and the wicked people of this world, then this world wouldn't be as bad as it is now. Christians should use the word of God and speak out against the wicked music that is drawing people away 
and the modern perversions of the Bible and the wicked movies and TV shows. We should cry out against the fake Christians like Westboro Baptist Church who are ruining the reputation of Christians. They're making people think that they are what Christians represent, and that would be hate. It's okay to use the words of God to judge what is evil and what isn't evil. It isn't righteous judgment. It is righteous judgment to say it's wicked to be a sodomite, and that it's wicked to teach kids that it is that it is okay to be a sodomite, whether at school. The public schools are teaching this now, and Christians should be crying out against what they're doing. If we do this, then wickedness isn't going to spread like a plague. The more you keep your mouth shut about these things, the more they will spread. But this has been a study on Bible weaponry. I plan on doing some more of these, but I'm going to go ahead and end this one with Ecclesiastes 9.18, which says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good.